Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Young Adults Today podcast, where we talk about reaching young adults in our world today. And like always, I'm joined by my husband and co-host. Hey, guys, I'm Josiah Keneally. Thrilled to be here with you, Micah, and the listener. Yes. It's a joy to come into your headphones, your commutes, your office space, your dorm room, your home, wherever you're at. Thanks for subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing this content. It helps us reach more leaders with the message of Young Adults Today and Today is really exciting. Mm-hmm. We are going to talk about leadership, self-development, growth, and we're joined by Anne Hyatt. How are you? Welcome to the show. I'm great. Thanks for the warm welcome. I'm thrilled to be here, to connect with all of you, and thank you so much for the invitation. 100%. And Anne, for, like, for the listener, I feel like this is a really big deal that Anne is willing to uh, spend time with us. She is a really big deal. And she, literally on the other side of the globe, right? Yes, now. <laughs> coming to us from Spain. And she has a remarkable story. I won't tell it, but I'll just share a little bit about a, a bio, but it's rare that somebody straight out of college would, would find themselves as Jeff Bezos' right hand. Mm-hmm. Pretty incredible. But in, in 2002, and did just that. In fact, throughout her career, she has been the right hand of some of the big techs, um, biggest names, whether it was Yahoo's Marissa Mayer, former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, now having left Silicon Valley and is sharing the secrets behind the curtain to help others like us, young leaders, advance their careers, maybe adapt to the same forward thinking that drove these leaders to their success and Man, we just want to say welcome one more time. And and can you just dive in? We're going to talk about leadership for young leaders. Mm -hmm. Can you share maybe some of your leadership journey, some of your life story, maybe even what it was like starting out 22 years old, fresh out of college and landing your first gig? Yeah, it's been quite a ride. That's for sure. It's still so funny. Every time I hear my bio, I'm like, did that really happen? (laughs) Crazy, unexpected journey of mine. No, it's been really fun. I feel so privileged and lucky to have had these adventures. I am actually the oldest of seven kids and my parents are both farmers. In fact, I'm first generation non-farmer in the history of my family. Wow. wow. So, so my career in tech was beyond unexpected, I have to say. But I think being raised in a young family, a family with lots of kids, where you have a lot of responsibility, you have to be really organized and a self-advocate to get anything done, to get people on your team and behind you know, whatever you want to play or do, uh, has served me pretty well in bossing around some of the most powerful people in the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> unexpected background, but came in handy. <laughs> so I was actually born on an Air Force base. Um, my dad, while he was young and w- waking up at 5 a.m. to milk the cows and work the fields, dreamed of another life. So he set a goal for himself to become not just a pilot, but a fighter pilot. And against all odds, he realized that dream. So I was born just after he finished his pilot training and was chosen for the elite force to fly the F-4 Phantom fighter jets. And so I was born on McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. My next two sisters were born on as far apart from that as you can get in the continental US, they were born in Anchorage, Alaska. And that was where most of my childhood took place. And after that, my dad um, reinvented himself a third time and then went to law school, put himself through school, uh, worked as a janitor at night, you know, to just put food on the table while he was um, working on that. And then we settled in Seattle where he got his first big job. They did not expect how much that would change the course of my life, choosing to go to Seattle. Because we uh, got a house in Redmond, which was at the time a small town. They chose it because we could have a big garden in the back and our friends, our neighbors had horses. It was just more of a comfort zone outside the big city of Seattle. But Microsoft is founded in Redmond, Washington and just burst all around us within less than five minutes from our front door, the personal computing revolution was taking off. And I grew up in a very tech heavy city. In fact, my very first job when I was 16 years old, I took that job two weeks after I got my driver's license was at a startup in Redmond, Washington, founded by two brothers who just graduated from Harvard business school. And that was my first education. My first start into the workforce was working for a five person startup, but I never expected that after graduation, as you mentioned, my my very first real job after undergrad was working directly for Jeff Bezos at Amazon in the foundational years of that company. It was a wild start to my career. Epic. Oh that, my is, that is a wild ride. Well, thank you for sharing with the audience and with us today. You have 
clearly come from a very ambitious background, like family, and that's been passed mm-hmm. off down to you. We know that I'm from North Dakota, so I know how hard fr- farming is. We have farming um, yep. community around um, where I grew up. Uh, we we weren't farmers, but I know how hard it is and just um, yeah. what, that, what that means yeah, totally. and what, that, what, what dedication that takes. And obviously you were you know, stationed at many different locations throughout your upbringing. And yeah. just because, you know, we have many of our listeners who are kind of landing that first job and they're always looking for insight of how do I be the best leader I can exactly. be and how do I follow well, you know, and just uncovering yeah. who they are and what their natural gifts are and what they kind of lean towards or just all those different things are kind of uncovered when you're working alongside some very mm-hmm. influential people and brilliant minds. And you've worked some of, with some of the most brilliant minds and some of the brightest minds in leadership in our generation. And I was just curious, would you be willing to share some of your best leadership insight for the leaders and listeners today? Well, Micah, I think you just hit on something really important in that you asked the question, how do you follow well? Mm -hmm. I feel like everyone wants to skip that step and become the leader themselves. And especially now when everything's so Instagrammed and you're seeing the end or the falsified perfection versions of people's stories, first, we kind of have to just do a little bit of a listening tour, Mm -hmm. earn our place at that, in that seat or in that room. And to follow well is how you learn how to be a good leader. And that was very much um, the theme of my entire Amazon career, really. Once I got my seat in that room, I realized pretty quickly that I had no idea how to be successful in that environment. And so I really treated it like a business school. Honestly, I w- I kept a notebook on my desk during those three years and I wrote down every name. I didn't know every acronym because tech is like a whole language unto sure. itself. I did not understand at first. So I kept a list of those terms or people or characters or questions that I had about a meeting when I didn't fully understand what was happening. And then I would go to my manager, John, and just ask some clarifying questions. And, you know, I had just come straight out of school and I knew how to do that. So I kind of treated my job as school and did my homework and would kind of research and read up on it. And then I was able to ask the right questions, anticipate some needs. And then eventually once I'd honed those skills, then I could be helpful. I could be proactive and offer some suggestions, but a lot of it is in those first jobs, just ask the right questions, lean into it and do your own homework. And then you form these natural mentorships. That was certainly true at my very first job at 16 in that startup, which was such a great learning environment because everyone was wearing all the hats and just rolling up their sleeves. And so I think a lot of those early opportunities just come from one leaning in, not only outworking everyone, but kind of out caring everyone around you, like not just treat it like a task list, but like, why is this important to the company? How can I use kind of my talents or interests, passions or values? How can I represent those in my work today? And that will get you noticed. So that more than anything else qualified me for my next future roles that more resembled the the career trajectory I wanted to have. But you really kind of have to spend those early years doing a listening tour, banding together your tribe of mentors, asking the right questions, and just being willing to try on a lot of things. I love it. And you have been on a remarkable journey and we get to join you today. This has been such a fun <laughs> episode of prep for and the yeah. read for, and just to, to get to sit with you and, and pick your brain. Um, tech is a space that interests us. Young leadership is a mm-hmm. space that interests us. And I think that going back to something you said in your intro story of something that your dad did a few times mm-hmm. um, was reinventing himself. And mm-hmm. we're working with a generation of like, if you talk millennials and generation Z mm-hmm. is really the demographic of a lot of the young leaders that we're working with are right. college students or young leaders and um, their career trajectory might have a few reinvention steps. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And like, Oh my gosh. Yes. From people in your dad's generation, people mm-hmm. in your generation. And, and I'm specifically curious to ask you, how can we reinvent ourselves and how can the listener reinvent themselves in a post pandemic world? And, and ultimately with the goal of being like Micah said, the best version of themselves that they can be, and maybe yeah. to reach that next level in their, in their dreams, in their vision, in their goal, in their career. Oh, Josiah, we could talk about that for hours. That question, (laughs) I think it's so important. Um, Let me see if I can do it some justice. So first I want to say, I can probably relate to how this feels more than one might expect. 
because I actually started my career. Remember, I graduated from undergrad in 2002. That was just after the dot-com bust. Well, that wasn't a pandemic. It was a major shift, especially in a tech-heavy city like Seattle. Trillions of dollars of investments had gone up in smoke overnight. Everyone was kind of in a panic of, wait, we thought this was the next big thing, and now it's just kind of maybe disappeared. And it was a really uncertain time. And I put out 50, maybe a hundred resumes and in preparation for graduating undergrad and didn't get a single call back, like nothing. And that was really scary. So I had to be a little bit creative and think outside of my plan A. And I had been working two student jobs while going to undergrad. And one of those was at the European Union Center where we were educating people about the Euro was launching that year. This is how old I am. In 2002, Euro was launching. So it was this new economy, new, new currency. It was um, a really fun job, but it paid like five cents an hour, I think, and I shared it with <laughs> people. Um, but the director of that program changed my life because he asked me, hey, what are you doing after graduation? I told him the situation. And he just said, kind of offhandedly, have you thought of applying at Amazon, mm -hmm. which I had not because I was not planning to work in tech um, because his wor wife worked in recruiting there. So sometimes it's just following that thread, that unexpected journey and just being like, but let's see what happened. Being open to something beyond your plan A. Then um, fast forward in my career, it's 2008. I'm at Google. I was kind of rising through the ranks. I was being seen as a next generation young leader. And I was, I applied myself. Back then you had to self-nominate for promotions. I had self-nominated for a promotion for the very first time. And then the 2008 crisis happened. And then Google's like, never mind, like freezing, no high, you know, no transfers, no job things. And it felt like opportunities disappeared. But again, it was kind of the best thing that ever happened to me because in that environment, I got really creative about being an entrepreneur. I couldn't get an official new title or promotion or ladder, but I still had that craving to be seen as a leader and to have a bigger impact than the confines of my traditional job description. And so it taught me some essential skills for once those formal opportunities for promotion were open to me again. And then just now I finally got brave after 12 years at Google to leave and become a founder myself, not knowing that just over a year later, the pandemic would happen and everything would be turned upside down. So I just want to let all your listeners know, if you are feeling kind of like dizzied from all these pivots and changes and your plans, your plan A's, B and C's might've disappeared. This can be an amazing silver lining in your journey because it's going to force you to get creative and to come back to what I'm really finding. Even my CEO consulting clients right now are doing is going back to your core values, yeah. your mission, your yeah. passions, and letting those inform where am I taking my life and my career? That I think is one of the most exciting parts of post-pandemic life is I see major corporations all the way down to those just entering the workforce, recentering on what they value most and being really thoughtful about how they're going to put it out there. I'm going to pause because I've been talking for a while. There's so many layers to your question, but I, that's honestly where I start is that this can be the best thing that's ever happen to your life and career journey. I love it. I love the fact that, and you're just a very positive person. Um, in the short amount of time that we've been talking, I feel like you're very positive. You're very insightful. And if you're like, if there's a will, there's a way, like we can get around this, we can work through this, we can reinvent mm -hmm. and um, pivot if a pivot needs to happen. And to take that as um, a new charge, like your values and your cores don't have to change. It's the approach right. of how to infiltrate and put the infrastructure together to move things forward, whether that's moving people around org charts, or maybe it's just even the approach of how do you reach the people or how do you run the organization mm -hmm. off online versus in person or whatever people may yes. be running behind the scenes. And I love that you talked about like uh, the core values I wrote down here. I'm taking notes while you're talking too. But, <laughs> you know, like those two jobs that you were working, like you were a dedicated student and many young leaders that we're working with, unfortunately want to just, I got my four-year degree or I got my master's or whatever. And I moved on my education and yeah. um, you know what? I want to get paid a hundred thousand, at least a year on my first job that I land. <laughs> And I don't want to, you know, work during my school years, you know, so they, they have debt, they're trying to navigate the future. But when you sit down and talk with some individuals, they can't ask or answer the basic question. Do you know where you're going? And do you know what you want in life? And, and 
I think that's so important. And I love that you're honing us back in on this message. Cause I think if, if people listening to this conversation only take away one thing, I hope it's this. And I also want to let you all know when you sit down to do it, if you're doing it properly, this is a hard exercise. I start all of my consulting clients and these are major CEOs with like hundred million dollar investments, like major, they're very successful. And we always start here because it, to your point, Micah, this, if you don't have this clear, it really doesn't matter what else you're doing. You're kind of, you can waste energy if you don't know what that center is of what am I trying to contribute to this world? And, um, for me, it comes down to asking yourself three things. When I look back on some seemingly disjointed decisions I made in my career that really worked out for me, it comes down to, uh, and this was not this clear to me in the moments, but when I look back, I informed my career decision around three main things. The first was, what do I want to learn in this part of my career? A lot of us are very clear on what we want. We want that, that fancy title. We want that salary. We want that respect of when we go home for Christmas, like everyone's going to be real proud of what we're doing. Right. Yeah, Cause it sounds so impressive. <laughs> right. Right. But that in my experience, and I have had the privilege of working with some of the most powerful, wealthiest people in the world. I'll tell you right now, those things do not correlate with happiness. Mm -hmm. I know some really miserable people with very fancy titles and paychecks. So what you really want to do is know what you want to contribute in the world. And so the first for me is more about what do you want to learn from this phase of your career, especially when you're early on, uh, this is when the world is your oyster. So really go after the opportunities where you're going to learn the most. The second is seek out the leaders that you not only like, but that you want to become like Mm -hmm. the leaders who are running their teams, having those um, leadership skills who are the type of having the hard conversations in the way you hope to be able to manage it, who are standing on the stages you want to stand on, who are leading a team of of similarly minded people. So that's where you're going to really gather these best practices. We've all heard that uh, saying that you become the average of the five people you spend the most of your time with. So be very choosy, especially early in your career. What are the, go for the highest quality people you can possibly find. And then the third thing I look for is disruption. Now I know we feel like we've had enough, enough disruption with the pandemic. And I don't just mean like that, like major life-changing turned upside down. By that, I mean, don't get too comfortable. And this is this is something that can happen mid-career after you find kind of your comfort zone, you've got this skill set, you know what to highlight on your resume. That is a moment where you want to put yourself in that driver's seat and disrupt yourself before an industry or a life event does it for you, because then you can be very proactive and selective about where you're going next. And so when those three things are true for me, I'm in a good zone. I love my work. I don't mind where, you know, I've been in industries where a hundred hour weeks are not unusual. The reason I didn't burn out doing that for 15 years was because every day I showed up being like, this is the most fun I can imagine, have, imagine mm-hmm. having mm-hmm. not because every day was like glamorous or with, it was often, you know, a slog, but the cause that we were serving pulled me forward. And so if you can find those three things are true, you, you know, you're in a good place and then ask yourself, like if one or especially if two of those are out of balance, now's a great moment to seek out a new challenge, a new role or team, or maybe a new uh, company. And what you said, I think, and it's just so good. And I just want to clarify and zero in on for a second. Can you state those three things that you're really hoping that people take away from, from this conversation? Those, those three things. Career happiness for me comes down to the three categories of being very clear, what do I want to learn in this stage of my career and find seeking out an environment where you can learn that really fast. Second is working for a leader you not only like, but want to become like. And third is be your own disruptor. Make sure that you are the one who are, who's making the decisions about where you're going to spend your time, your energy, talents, and influence. And when those three things are all present, you can find so much joy in your career, regardless of the pace or risk Mm -hmm. or kind of thrill, thrill slash terror that does come with being an entrepreneur. Um, That for me is the uh, recipe for happiness. I love it. And thank you for recapping those. That is a power packed message. And um, something that I heard you say that I didn't say, but it resonates deeply with me. And I know it does for the listener too. And I I just ask the listener to pause and, and answer this question or reflect on this for a second. What good does it do to gain the whole world, like all the money you could have, the biggest company, the most recognition, the most recognition, the most prestige, um, what good is it gain to, to, you know, what good is it do to gain the whole world, 
but be empty inside, be miserable. Maybe even go to a place where you're like, I've lost myself, or mm-hmm. I've lost my soul. And you're talking to a group of young leaders, by the way, as we get to know them and dialogue, what I noticed in about this generation, they would rather their desperate desire is to make an impact even more so than it is to make an income. Mm-hmm. Isn't that I crazy? love that. This is my favorite thing about this next generation of leaders coming up. I wholeheartedly agree. My sister, um, I'm the oldest of seven. My sister, who's the youngest of the seven, she's 21. She's in her master's program and she is doing exactly that, making some choices now to align herself with the value that she wants to give to the world. She is very dedicated to mental health. She's, um, you know, looking about how she can create communities, environments, or center her career around empowering and helping people find that balance and that happiness when that is very complex. She's leaning into that. Mm -hmm. Could she choose something more lucrative or less stressful? Maybe, but that's what fills her up with joy is to be able to serve a community of people who are really struggling, especially now. I see that as a common denominator among this generation. And, um, sometimes I get from the older generation, people ask me like, how do I channel millennials? Or how do I get this, you know, Gen Z's, you know, how do I get that same grit out of them? And I say, I hone them these leaders on that of like, if you want to get the most out of them, connect their daily tasks, which yes, in the beginning of your career may not resemble your dream job, help them see how learning those skills and building this foundation today Mm -hmm. qualifies them to serve this larger purpose. Mm -hmm. I love seeing highly effective teams centered around a core mission, a common value, and a common drive to serve the world in a very specific way. That is super powerful. And one of the things that gives me the most hope for the future. My gosh, that's invigorating to me. I think you're touching on a passion point for Lincoln and I, and a big part of why this podcast exists is to help reach yeah. the next generation and to be a resource, provide relationships mm-hmm. and rallying points. And uh, we believe in the next generation so, so much. And it's invigorating to hear you share that passion. And one of the things that's off script, but you, like Micah said, exude a joy. You're mm-hmm. exude, you're beaming right now. <laughs> and and you have clearly what I would describe as a, a power that comes from thinking positively, believing the best. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's that's the read that I'm getting. Are you willing to talk about maybe your philosophy of, of thought process or because we're facing challenges, all of us, mm-hmm. the listener is, how do you approach great challenges with great joy? I am so grateful to have learned it from the best. I mean, the greatest privilege of my life is that my core nuclear family and my mentors and bosses who are now celebrity CEOs, I knew them in their infancy when they were the 1.0 nerd version of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they, weren't, yeah, they weren't yet billionaires or like power, most powerful people in the world. But I'm so grateful to have had that modeled for me. I've watched these leaders build what is now so ingrained in our daily lives but we were making it up as we went. They were taking huge risks. They had enormous failures. They had hired people who disappointed them and didn't really step up. And I watched very carefully. How did they have those conversations? What kept them from allowing that to throw them off their game? How did they just recenter and start again and take in that information? So I I'm glad that, that I can carry that forward. And honestly, this is my mission. Now my personal, when I left Google, it was a time of massive disruption in my life. Some stuff in my personal life had changed dramatically. My last remaining like semblance of my personal identity was very much attached to that job. And I recognized that. And I thought, and you've got to go in front of this. Like you need to be crafting your own life here. And I wanted to center it around values. This is back in 2018. And I wrote, uh, I sat down, it was actually really hard. I sat down to write my own individual, me as a person mission statement. A lot of companies do that, or maybe a team, but so few people do it for themselves. And I actually found this so challenging and so rewarding that I've actually created a download to help walk people through this because it was so hard for me to do alone. We should totally get that and link yeah. it in the show notes. Yes. Okay. I yeah. would cool. love to cool. share cool. that with you all. The, honestly, it's so long. At first it started off as a one pager. Now it's like 10 pages because I think the details of this is really important. It's first identifying what do you value? What is your mission? What is your purpose? Like what do each of those words mean? And then how do you craft that for yourself? And then from that, then you have the building blocks you need to create your own mission statement. My individual mission statement now 
is to discover and empower underrepresented entrepreneurs through actionable education and mentorship. And actually the first word of that mission statement, discover, was the last part I added because I realized after trying to implement my mission statement that there are so many people out there who don't yet self-identify as an entrepreneur. They maybe can baby step imagine being an intrapreneur, but what I want you to see is right now where you are today, not when you're fancy or not when you've got this some kind of title or you're working for a startup or a tech company, that, that does not define you as an entrepreneur. What it does is like, I am in the driver's seat. I know what I want out of this. And I have created a playbook for myself mm -hmm. for how I want to get there. You are an entrepreneur if you feel any of those feelings. So I think step number one is really that defining for yourself, what is your individual mission as a human on this planet? What are you going to contribute? And right now, no matter your age or your stage in life, maybe you're 18, maybe you're 21, 25, Right now, think about the decisions you're making as your living legacy. People, mm -hmm. people, when I say that to my CEOs who are all older, they're like, I'm not retiring right now. I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how you spend your time, your mm -hmm. money, and your influence right, right now so is good. your living legacy. So wow. start right now. Oh my gosh. I already took <laughs> notes before you even said that. And I'm so glad, Anne, that you went there because I literally wrote down. So when Josiah and I got married four and a half years ago, we literally sat down in Hawaii at the beach with a notebook and beginning the end in mind. Like we literally took notes of where oh. do you want to be at the end of life? Mission towards statement. Retirement. Yes. All yes. that kind of stuff. And most people are like, you did that your first year of marriage? I'm like, yeah. And then every year on our anniversary, we go and we look at what has been accomplished, what has been done, what we need to like pivot and change and maybe like- Course correct. Or yeah, adjust. it could be kids, yeah. it could be a car, it could be home, it could be just, are we, are we emotionally, are we physically, relationally, spiritually, like are we fit right now or are we just running around crazy and just unstable as individuals and just kind of recalibrate. And it's, it's just been an awesome thing. So for the listener, even beginning with the end in mind, like so what do you want your organization, your corporation, your church, your leadership, whatever that is, your what, life. what do you want people to remember you by? And I literally wrote legacy, like what legacy do you, do you want to leave behind and how can you begin with the end in mind? And maybe that for some people is a morbid thought, but it's like life goes so quick for yep. some people. It's like, whoa, I'm done with four years of school. Oh my kids are 10 years old. Oh my gosh, I'm yep. 30 already. What? You know, like, so mm -hmm. there's like moments in life where they're like, I haven't fulfilled any of my dreams, my passions, my desires. I've just been on autopilot for yes. 10 years and I can't recall a thing, you know? So, and we get one shot yes, at this life know. on planet earth, by yes. the way. I was just listening to a podcast and they said they were talking about timeouts. I think it was Tommy Newberry who was talking about like the mental capacities. Like there are no timeouts in life. If you're in a baseball game or whatever, like you can call a timeout, you can call a replay, you can call all those things and you can, you know, look at that, but you can't convert that into life, like real life. Yes. I can't be like, Hey, I need a 30 second timeout or a 60 second timeout as a mom or a, a leader <laughs> no. or a wife or whatever. It's like, you're on, you're on. And there, there's no, there's no take backs either, you know? Yep. So we can't do the Insta real play, but if we're in a healthy place and we are able to begin with the end in mind and live out the legacy currently, that's just a beautiful thought to begin with. And we know that you've actually written a book. It's your most recent project, I believe. You're probably working on other things yep. behind the scenes. But for the <laughs> listener, and you have wrote a book called Bet on Yourself. Recognize, own, implement, and break through opportunities. Show the, yes. show the YouTube real quick. Show the YouTube. It looks amazing. <laughs> and if you've been watching, you see it behind <laughs> and it's looking good. Thank you. You've been, you've been working on this um, and you obviously have it out mm -hmm. and everything. Can you just share with us and the listener why you wrote this and what you hope the listener and reader gets out of the things that you've been downloading maybe to us right now or what's been you know written in this book for us? Yeah, Mike, I just want to like reflect back to the both of you yeah. that what you commented on me about that positive energy and that thing. I think, um, I don't know you well, I've listened to many of your podcast episodes and I have a sense of you and your values and what you're contributing to your beautiful community. But what you just shared about the process of sitting down with that notebook in Hawaii, that mm -hmm. will serve you your whole lives together. Like that is just the best time you could have spent. And I think that is why when people first hear you, 
your message, your, what you're trying to contribute is so clear in the first sentence. And I think that's a power that I would love every single person listening right now to claim for themselves. So I thank you for, for sharing what you did to get to where you are right now. It's really inspiring. Um, and that really is a beautiful segue into why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. I, um, I was a unwilling author for a very long time. I, several people were like, please say you're writing a book. Cause I saw these irreplicable moments in time. I saw the internet be invented. I saw the gold standard of e-commerce. I saw literally the engineers who've written the code behind uh, apps and uh, services that we use every single day in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. It was a great privilege to be there. But I thought if people want to learn the best practices of Jeff Bezos or Google or Eric Schmidt, they literally already wrote those books. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what am I what am I? I'm just me. I'm just little me. Why would I do that? But there was a couple of reasons why I came around. And one was, I realized that I was the only person who had, um, witnessed the cross section, the best practices of multiple high impact mm -hmm. CEOs mm -hmm. of Google, of Yahoo, of Amazon. So I have that privilege of understanding what Jeff has in common with Eric, with Marissa, what, so I have that playbook of best practices. Wow. And that to me, somebody, it finally clicked in my brain. I saw, honestly, I think it was just like this little, uh, infographic on Instagram one day when I saw, I just feel like it was like the universe telling me this, it, but it, this infographic said, there's someone out there who can only learn it from you. And that was like a bolt of lightning wow. to my soul yep. that said, and wake up, like you have a calling and you need to show up for that person, even if it's just one. And so I wrote the book to translate the best practices of these seemingly super performers, superhumans, to show you the, the book is honestly my career as a case study. Yes. It's full of like crazy stories of the foundation of the internet and how all these, you know, all the behind the scenes of building a tech company. But most importantly to me is it is me translating the best practices I saw from my CEO bosses and how I put that into my life, um, which was, could have remained small and reactionary and unremarkable. And I translated that for us normal people so that you can do it too. You can take, because I find other people are like, oh, well, Jeff does that, but that has no relevance on my life. I'm showing you that it does. And I want to give that to you in a very actionable format so that you can make some seemingly little bets on yourself and engineer serendipity. There's a way that you can create luck, even when opportunities appear limited. And that's what I hope readers take away from the book. That's so good. The practicality of it. I think there's so many things that people like I need. So if you're listening to a podcast or like this big breakthrough message and they're just like, well, yeah, that worked for you and that's good, but how do I apply that to my life? And sometimes we mm -hmm. need that step one, two, yep. three, get out your notebook, get out your pen and paper, start thinking, reflecting, write down what you're passionate about, like whatever that is. And sometimes in order for us to do that, we need to be challenged. So when we're reading things like this or like, well, mm -hmm. duh, like that sounds so easy. You know, it's like, well, can you get out of bed? Yeah, that doesn't sound too scary. Can you pick up right. the paper? Yes, I can do that too. <laughs> well, and one of my favorite quotes is from a book called Joshua. And it, it just says, be strong and courageous. Yeah. You know what I mean? What a message. Be strong, yes. be courageous. And so many times I want to be, but maybe I'm not. And oh, me too. And know, these super performers, by the way, like they are not strong and courageous every day, but they circle back there frequently. They yeah. get discouraged. They have those hard moments. And then they remember I am strong. I am brave. I'm going to choose to be that today. So it's okay. If you have a moment of weakness, so do they, but yeah, that is cool. such a helpful mantra, a beautiful scripture to just come back to and yes. reflect on and think like, okay, yeah, well, I can trust and, that. And I'm human. Like I have human yeah. issues and human <laughs> moments. I, I think that also like I, I do believe in eternity and I think we're eternal beings living the human yep. experience on planet earth. And I'm curious, That's right. I'm curious to know, like, has there been anything that you'd be willing to share maybe and about your story in, in regards to boldness and courage? Because the reason I asked this, by the way, is because like from the outside looking in, for me to go to Amazon, it'd be a fun tour. It'd be fun to go on a listening <laughs> and a learning tour, but to show up in the early days, like that's a bold, courageous step. And, and, um, yeah. you know, the pivots along the way in Google, but what have you learned and that you'd be willing to maybe share about boldness, strength, courage? Cause I think that's what we're all looking for. Mm. I want to reassure anyone out there who doesn't yet 
self-identify as bold and courageous risk taker. Neither am I. Uh, my nature is actually very timid. Thankfully, my career has nurtured that out of me. Wow. My nature is very measured. It's perfectionist in all the negative connotations. Like I hold myself back out of fear of looking stupid in front of people's whose opinions matter to me or, you know, having that nobody likes that. Even these super performers, when stuff fails, I know we talk in tech, a big talk of like, we love failure. We hate failure. But what we do is we love what you learn from it. Yeah. That's actually yeah. the accurate statement. So I want to let you know out there, if you're like, I'm not a bold risk taker, it can be taught but I baby stepped my way into that. So I started off at Amazon and I think honestly, the only reason I made it through the nine months it took me to get hired for that job was a bit of naivete. Had I fully appreciated what was ahead if I got this job, I would have been terrified, like appropriately terrified because I didn't have any of the skills or qualifications or experience necessary to like step in on day one and be successful. I had to sit back and listen and really uh, think about that. So I'm going to pause. Cause I think Micah, you had a, no, you look good. like you have a reaction to that. No. Okay. <laughs> Didn't want to talk over you, but I think, um, so in that boldness, you can set micro goals for yourself. Wow. So for me, that, that notebook of all the stuff I didn't understand was me being like, okay, I clearly have no business having this job. So I'm going to qualify myself for this seat. I'm going to do my homework. I'm going to outwork everyone else. I came in an hour minimum before anyone else to do that self-imposed homework every morning. And I babysat my way into feeling qualified and then brave enough to ask a question in the meeting. And then once those questions have been answered, then I was making a suggestion in the meeting. So I think it's okay if your boldness comes in these small doses. That's wow. brave. Yeah. That's brave to be like, I bring a novice factor here. I'm going to figure out how to make that an advantage because you have a different perspective than the seasoned veterans. You have this um, great ability to see solutions that the people who know the best practices and the way that things have always been done cannot see anymore. Right. So use your unique background, your perspective, your fresh eyes on it as an advantage and don't bow out of that. Don't, um, in, in tech, we have, I, one of my favorite things I learned there is the hippo effect. It, uh, hippo stands for the highest individually paid person's opinion. Often when that's expressed, all innovation stops. Wow. So wow. you as the novice, if you can get your comments in early in the conversation and be bold to just, and sometimes it's just asking the right question. You don't have to know the answer, mm -hmm. but if you can ask the right question, you can get those experts in the room to maybe look at solutions from a different way or think of something they wouldn't have to. And you can help them avoid that hippo effect of celebrating the differences. And I learned that I'm so honestly, I would not have earned learned this as fast as I did, had I not come into tech at this beautiful moment where I, as the junior most member of the company was surrounded by these senior vice presidents who also had no idea what they were doing <laughs> because mm -hmm. no one had ever done it. We were inventing the future. And so right. I saw it modeled around me of let's just ask the right questions, gather the right data, try right. some stuff, learn really fast, and then try again. And so because I saw that modeled from the top, from the quote unquote experts in the room, I thought, okay, this is a safe space for me to do that also. So I, I'm very, very grateful to catch tech came into my life when it did, because it accelerated my learning of learning to trust myself and to be bold, even if that was in baby steps. I think that's so good. And, and to realize that the listener, like everybody has, everybody brings value, everybody, yep. whether it's recognizing a blind spot in me or being able to recognize, you know, walking through a SWOT analysis, like what are our strengths, our weaknesses, yep. opportunities, threats, like what's happening here? How do we become successful? And one thing that I've learned, I was on staff and I was taught in my internship, like learn how to ask good questions. It's really yes. important. Not yes and no questions, like ask yes. good questions. Know who's in the room. Don't talk about yourself. Pick, a, pick the brains of the people in the room. Like you had said, like identify the people that you want to become like, um, that mm -hmm. you value something that they bring to the stage or to the, the corporate organization. And um, set micro goals in that process wow. as a personal thing, but they're achievable. Like I can achieve these goals. It's like, it's not like taking one bite out of the elephant. You're not going to eat the whole thing. Yeah. Sitting. You got to take one bite at a time, you know, that silly saying or whatever, but I'll just jump ahead. here and say, I, I, in one of my hobbies is I study leadership. Like I love reading books like yours, different case studies. One of the examples of this in action that I've found that I've really been inspired by their work is like 
Pixar before they were with Disney too. And I, yes. I think it is translated, but Ed Catmull writes in Creativity Inc. that they surrounded the table, the decision-making table, and they brought interns in. Yep. And at first it was like, but some of their best ideas mm-hmm. for animation and for graphics and for some of their, their best performing motion pictures came from, you got it, an intern. And so I think yes. it's a posture of humility that leaders demonstrate. And then there's a posture of, of just being willing to, to be bold and to be brave and to connect right. that. Well, I think it takes a secure leader to ask an intern, you know, like, oh, well, you're 18. Mm-hmm. What do you know? No, as a leader, like, no, what do you know that we don't see? Like, yeah. how do we, if our target audience is your generation, they are your people. Let's talk about that. What are you guys asking and what are you willing to like step into and what are we missing in that process? So I think we all have blind spots, but to recognize um, we need to be humble leaders willing to serve each other, but serve mm-hmm. the ultimate vision and the core values of personal, but then also the entity of which we're working for. So, so I couldn't agree more What people often ask me, what is, if I had to pick a single common denominator between all of these high impact leaders that I've worked for, they are often surprised that my characteristic number one is humility. And for exactly the reasons you two just outlined, they're the ones who avoid the hippo effect. They not only tolerate, but demand that everyone around them challenge their ideas, poke holes in all their favorite like solutions and keep them on their toes so that they're innovating instead of getting comfortable, which leads to disruption and stagnation. And I, I think if a, a young person and can contribute in that way to a team. Now, obviously you want to like earn your place there. You want to make sure your questions are smart. You want to have done your homework. You want to be, you know, doing it wisely. But once you've done that, you've earned the right to ask that question. You can be, it's amazing. Josiah, since you, I know you're interested in this. Um, I need to send you a link to a Harvard business Re- review article that describes exactly what you're talking about there. I think it was a study of, it was Gucci or one of these super, super luxury brands Um, what they've done is they created a shadow board where they brought in those intern level people literally into the boardroom with their experts to offer that fresh, fresh perspective, whatever this luxury brand was, um, they saw astronomical performance compared to their other luxury brand peers, because they got into the digital influencer thing years before their other, before their competitors. And I think that is such a beautiful example of that humble leadership that you were talking about and such an interesting case study. I mean, the, the numbers, if you just look at the data, like by far, like the best money they've ever spent was creating the shadow board of young leaders who had a different perspective on luxury goods. It was incredible. No kidding. That's fascinating to me. It's exciting to me. And what you're talking about too, is like essentially a return on investment that was maybe shocking to some with disrupting with some. And and I know that one of your messages is about defining your own ROI. And you you talk about it of recognizing opportunities, owning your big dreams, implementing new habits, and you have that free download. Any thoughts, comments, or practical insight on how maybe for the person who's evaluating their own mission statement, trying to sketch out the beginning and the end in mind, like any thoughts or perspective on that? Yeah. I encourage you to do this and do it often. Just like you guys go back to your notebook from your honeymoon and you revisit that and be like, have we pivoted it off course? Or maybe we do want to change something in our foundational values as, as you have kids or as your life pivots, like maybe it's recentering around something. So I think this is something, if you haven't done it yet, today is a great day to start on recognizing, owning, and implementing what you really want out of your life. And then revisit that often. I have a tradition of doing it on my birthday. My birthday is in October. It's a great time. It's the end of the year. We're starting to think about new year's resolutions. So I revisit my mission statement on my birthday. Think about what am I contributing in the year to come? So yes, you're right. First step is recognize. What is it that I value? That's about that mission, vision, value statement. Uh, is own is the O. So that is what stakeholders do I need to get on board? Whether that's my life partner, my manager, my kids, we, I want to have a conversation with them about what I'm trying to do and what I'm going to sacrifice in order to get there, because that's going to affect my tribe around me. Think about the ripple effect of that. And third is then once I've got my stakeholders on board, we've all agreed this reflects what we want to be doing together. Then we implement, and that's where we set those 
those goals for ourselves. And we think, okay, here's my plan of attack. And I encourage you, if you're just getting started, don't pick more than three because you're going to have your, if you've done this right, you've got a list of a hundred things. Cause you know, we're talking about life meaning and, and, um, anyway, so don't get overwhelmed. Just pick for now three to five things that you want to accomplish as the first steps towards that and really start to implement that. You're going to learn some interesting things, some things that you think are going to be super high impact don't turn out that way. Mm-hmm. And the other side of that coin is like a couple of things that you thought were throwaway efforts. You're like, oh my gosh, like look at the effect that this is already having. And you double down on that. So be willing to pivot in implementation and then return to that core center, that North star, that values, whatever you want to call it, and making sure that that foundation is really, really solid through frequent revisits. And I want to go quickly back to something that Mike was talking about earlier, which is about asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. I think in this recognize, own, and implement process, an important part of that is gathering the feedback from peers, mentors, shareholders in your life. And a lot of that is it's really hard to get uh, good feedback, especially when you're younger. And especially for women, actually, statistically, women get feedback on um, what they're doing, but not like on their core skills, but not how they're being received on their leadership, so the softer traits. So I encourage you to do something that at first is a little awkward. When you're getting some feedback, if somebody says like, okay, I think next time we do this, I'd love to see you, I, you know, let's do this differently. Really double down on that. And um, in tech, we call it, it's a very morbid term, but we call it a post-mortem. When something's gone wrong, then we really break it down into replicable steps. This happened, then this, then this. And you find that moment where we're like, and here's where we're going to insert a different solution. So we have a different result, but mm-hmm. equally important What most companies don't do, and I think the high impact ones and high impact individual lives do, is they also do a postmortem on their successes. And this is weird. Mm. This part is like when when someone says, oh my gosh, good job. That interview um, that you did last week was just so on point. So many insight after insight. You could ask then, what about that exactly? Could Could you identify what was the question that stands out in your mind? That feels weird because it's not like you're just about the additional pats on the back. But again, you're trying to create a formula of like, how can I replicate that? How can I continue to give and inspire an interview at that level? And that's when you get some really high quality feedback, especially early in your career from people because you invite them to be really thoughtful in their feedback and give you that formula for replication. So I would really encourage you once you've started on your recognize, own and implement personal ROI, dig into some feedback and seek it out because I've actually found that that kind of detailed feedback does not come unsolicited. So don't be shy. What I'm hearing you say too, towards the end there is like, say you win, whatever the win is, you hit the bullseye. Why do we hit that bullseye? Mm-hmm. It won. Why do we win? It, it went well, we succeeded. Why did it succeed? Because so often we only seek out, or I, I'll just talk about me. I really <laughs> seek it out. Like, how did that fail so miserably? Where did I yep. go wrong? But it's almost <laughs> like that question in reverse. Why did it go right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. That's great. That's great for the listener. And, and we know that you probably seen so many different trends with different generations kind of come through from technology to interviewing to how to reach whoever they're trying to reach. And are there any trends that you've seen or that you are seeing currently as it relates to the younger generation, specifically in the workplace or the workforce? I w- the biggest thing I'm seeing is something we we have touched on, which is that they really want to work on something that is purposeful, not only in their careers, but how they spend their dollars. They're very mindful of, is this company reflective of my values? For example, if a core value for you is about sustainability, is this company spending their resources in that way? Or if it's about diversity and inclusion, how are they um, not only hiring for that, but promoting from within Um you know, maybe reinvesting in training and this next generation of underrepresented leaders. So whatever those values are, they're asking those hard questions. They're doing the research and spending their dollars and their time and their influence accordingly. That is so exciting. This is not a trend I saw in earlier generations. I think um, before it was very reactionary. It was whatever was the big company in your town and you stayed there for 50 years and you just kind of stayed in your little sandbox. And then my generation where we're like, I want to invent a new future. Um, But then this one is a beautiful combination of all those things, super hard work, very, very dedicated and um, being mission focused and willing to pivot and uh, make some hard calls, honestly, much braver than my generation of being like, this is not aligned with what I do. I don't care what that paycheck or that title says. I'm going to go over here. I think Mm -hmm. that's very exciting. 
Mm-hmm. It is exciting. And we have, I love this conversation. It's been fun. It is, <laughs> you offer so much insight and um, just a, a deep well of a wealth of knowledge and experience and uh, wisdom. And so we, we yes. love to just, yeah, we, we love to take it one step deeper. We put five minutes on the clock, kind of go a okay. little bit rapid fire. We want to honor your time too in the process. <laughs> so five final thoughts, five questions, five minutes. First one, Okay. You could describe yourself in three words. What would they be? Ooh. Mm-hmm. Uh, petite powerhouse, maybe. Let's go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> One of the first things when people meet me in person for the first time, they always say like, oh my gosh, you're so small. I thought you would be much bigger because <laughs> I'm five foot two, which by the way, is the same size as Lady Gaga. And she's a powerhouse also. No so. kidding. No kidding. Yeah. All right. That's fun. Okay. Question number two. What is your dream in one sentence? Ooh. Oh, I think I'm going to cheat. I think I already said it. For some I think it's my, my mission statement. Awesome. To discover and empower underrepresented entrepreneurs through actual education and mentorship. That's the dream. We got a sneak peek and didn't even wow. know. If people- Thanks for your that's right. <laughs> Thanks for doing what you do. And that's really inspiring. Oh. <laughs> this is similar. Um, okay. If you could ask Mike and I any question. This keeps Ooh. us on our toes. This is the curve of us. What would you want to know or what would you ask us today? Uh, what scares you about your future? Like what part of that, a challenge or a dream or something? Is there something that's so important to you that you're willing to do it, but it scares you? I think for me, it's the ultimate, the ultimate goal, I think for I don't want to speak for you, but our mission statement has been essentially to, to reach and empower the next generation and to discover their purpose on this earth and, and beyond. And I think for me, my biggest fear is not necessarily a project or a title or a speaking engagement. It's nothing like that. It's getting to the end of my life and realizing that I didn't give it my all. Mm. I think that's my biggest fear in life of recognizing like why didn't I take more risks or why did I let my, I need to let my yes be yes and my no be no and not, you know, say yes to everything or no to anything, but just really navigate and come back to who am I? What am I called to? What is our mission statement? What is our legacy? And there's always a he, a she, and a we in a marriage. And to know that, yes, we are a married unit, but we're also individual people. And to know that, did I do everything that Micah, myself, was called to as a wife, as a mom, as a friend, as a daughter? And just did I give the world everything that I'm here for? Like, did I give it my all? I think that's my biggest fear would be getting to the end of my life and recognizing that I didn't <laughs> or I ran nice. scared yeah. somewhere. <laughs> and I think that shows in your contributions that that is top of mind. I think, yeah, that's interesting. Wow. Thank Josiah. You. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a deep, deep level, heart level question. And I think there's two small areas or, or two significant areas that I see fear maybe has held me back, might currently be holding me back. Or even as I look to the future, I'm aware that these are two areas that they, it might hold me back. We work kind of um, a little bit more in the nonprofit space or even mm-hmm. adults and helping not only companies and leaders, but also some churches really invest in the next generation I'm kind of a missing generation in this space and um, with that I think the two things that hold me back and how I'm wrestling through and processing real time number one is sometimes uh, okay so I'm the I look at myself sometimes as the provider I have a wife we have two small girls they're um, 19 months and three months at the time of recording this oh my and so busy family. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You guys look so fresh and rested. You must, you're not, I'm sure you can't be. You okay, so happy. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, and, and I guess with that, there's a degree of maybe financial risk or instability. And I'm not yep. necessarily extrinsically motivated by the big bank account or big paycheck, because if I was, I'd probably be doing some different things. But uh, I know we're on mission with impact and with our direction. And I know we're on the winning team. We're on the right thing. We're doing the right team together. But I think that sometimes I've wondered, okay, financially, does that make sense? Yep. Risk involved. It's our livelihood. It's our family. Am I going to be able to provide? So that's area one. Area two, I'm embarrassed to say this one, is what are other people thinking? Oh my gosh, me too. 
and, <laughs> and I thought, what's been helping me? And I told her this, I told Micah this last night. I go, Shelly Giglio, she's a great author and her and her husband doing some really great work. And um, she tweeted something or posted a tweet on Instagram and said, you're a calling doesn't need to be understood by other people because it wasn't a conference call. Is that it? I mean, it is a class. Yes. It really does. <laughs> Mic drop for that one. Yes. Right? And so I, I guess that has helped me wrestle or process like, okay, we might be misunderstood a little bit, or if we're not understood fully, that's going to be okay. Because you know what? It wasn't a conference call. It was kind of that personal individual call. Personal calling. calling versus a conference call, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Oh, love that. Yes. <laughs> that's beautiful. What you just said. Yes. Um, I, th- I would be cheating our five minute five and five. Um, but I, listeners, please go into the book and read the section on regret minimization. It wow. is exactly about this. This is how Jeff Bezos himself addressed those fears, those three fears you just like so vulnerably and authentically shared with all of us. He had the same And there is a way there's, he calls it his regret minimization principle. Or if you don't have the book, Google it right now. There's a beautiful, he's, he's talked about it in many, many press interviews. It addresses exactly those fears because these super performers have the same ones. And, and even on the financial risk of like, I'm following my passion and this might be the stupidest thing I've ever done because I'm leaving this opportunity to make some serious cash. Jeff left, like he was a very successful hedge fund manager and he left and packed his uh, wife into a car and drove to the other side of the country with nothing. And they built it in their garage, packing on their hands and knees, the wow. two of them, yeah. like he had a corner office making serious bank. He did that for his family. Wow. And I think that's really beautiful. So anyway, um, you. you're in good company. Awesome. Go back and read that everybody. If you don't, you know where to find it. And, Anne, question yep. number four, would you be willing to tell us one of the most epic failures maybe you've experienced in life and leadership that you would like to share with their audience? We love asking people this because we love to learn from each other. We can all laugh at ourselves now, or maybe <laughs> we can laugh with you right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this would take a long time to answer properly. So I'll just leave you with two little teasers. One is I share a story in the book where I literally within two months of getting my job with Jeff Bezos, nearly literally killed him. And if he had died that day, which was very, he maybe should have, if that had happened, I would have not only killed Jeff Bezos, but the entire company in Amazon. Cause at the stock at the time we weren't yet profitable and all the stock value was based in faith in him. So literally the worst day of my professional and personal life. Hopefully nothing ever tops that learned so much. Well, I'm literally get my hands get sweaty every time I even think about it, but I, if that hadn't have happened, some very important learnings about the way I saw myself and my ability to handle hard things wouldn't have ever happened. And it changed the way that I showed up at work from then on. Um, so that's one, that's a teaser. And then the second one is when I'm asked, what are the greatest regrets of my career? I honestly, I can't think of examples of like, oh, and there's so many times I cried at my desk so many times I I made big failures because I was in an environment where there was no choice. There's no avoiding those. Um, But honestly, those are not what keep me awake at night anymore. What I think is my biggest failure are those those moments of omission where I didn't get brave and raise my hand, or I didn't say, Hey, I want to be on that project or, Hey, I think I could contribute something uniquely here where I stayed small and invisible in the corner. Those are the ones I still think about of like, Anne, why, why didn't you raise your hand? Why didn't you say your name? Why didn't you do that? So honestly, it's the mistakes of omission that I think matter to me most. Good. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for going there, Anne. And uh, if you could kind of close this conversation by sharing with the young leader, the young listener who's, who's got a big vision and they're, they're starting out and they're, you know, the room's filled with them and we hand you the microphone and you can share one piece of encouragement, insight, or advice with them. What would you say? If I could only pick a sentence, it would be start today. There's so many of us who are waiting to be qualified or to be smart enough or accepted enough or to be understood enough. There's a lot of you listening right now that might have a dream that no one around you understands your parents or your community or your society or cultural expectations because of your gender or your age or, or anything that might hold you back. Find a tribe of like-minded people. This is the best part of the internet. They are there for you. Find a tribe of like-minded people and start today. Like really gather up that tribe of people who can support you. And I want you to get it. 
if I had to pick one thing that you would start, start today with, it would to get, be get, sorry, it would to be getting three things. One is a mentor, somebody who's just one step ahead of you and is there to train you up. Second is a sponsor. A sponsor is somebody who opens doors for you that you cannot open for yourself. This is actually included in that download that I mentioned before, because it's such an important part of converting theory into practice. Okay. And then the third thing is to set some audacious goals for yourself. So start today with gathering those things and get started and, and enjoy the journey because you're going to make some mistakes and it's going to be really fun. Awesome. Well, start listener, today. we are so grateful for you, Anne, and joining us. What a great Definitely. conversation, a great challenge to lead all of us on with getting a mentor getting a sponsor and set some audacious goals because we can't do it alone, right? We got to link nope. arms with people around us to move forward in life and the journey that we're all on, even though it may look different. So if you want to know more about Anne Hyatt and bet on yourself right here, you can do that when you connect with us on our website at youngadults.today, as well as across all of our other social media platforms at Young Adults Today. And again, this is Mike and Josiah signing off, and we're here with Anne Hyatt. Thank you so much, Anne.